Καλησπέρα σα. Καλησπέρα σα. Good evening, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be hosting uh, Gilles Barrault. Dr. Gilles Barrault is a lecturer and head of the Department of Linguistics at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. He holds a BA in Nordic Studies, Literature, Language and Culture from uh, Paris 5 in Sorbonne, and an MA, Paris 4 rather, sorry, and an MA in Language Education from Paris 5, again at the Sorbonne. He completed a PhD in Social Linguistics at the University of the Witwatersrand in 2017, with a dissertation in the semiotics and post on, of post-apartheid private urban development. He has published on the semiotic landscape of post-apartheid urban South Africa, focusing on multimodal science. He's currently writing about the semiotics of vulnerability in broader spaces, as well as gendered ideologies on wearable texts. Today, Gilles will be talking to us on culinary types, typographic landscape of the Eastern Food Bazaar in Cape Town. A very warm welcome to you, Gilles, from far off Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> you have the floor. You can share your slides, although we also have the slides on, in the room where we are. It might be a good idea to share your slides. I will share. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And hello to you all from very hot Johannesburg, even though it is currently nighttime uh, from, from my home. But I want to say thank you to the organizers of the Les All seminar series and Costas in particular for inviting me to speak about my work this evening. Uh, it's, it's an honor and I hope that you have not yet had dinner or might even eat during the talk because I'm going to talk a great deal about food this evening. Um, the work I'm going to present uh, looks at the typographic choices on the menu of a Pan-Asian and Middle Eastern fast food um, restaurant in Cape Town called the Eastern Food Bazaar. As the multimodal assemblages on the display menus, such as the one visible here as an example, they aim to index quite different culinary and cultural traditions. And in this talk, I will be making two arguments. One is that in the context of globalization, restaurant owners are pressured to resort to problematic cultural representations in order to appeal to the Western tourist. And that number two, typefaces can be used as language variations such as accents when indexing ethnocultural stereotypes, as is the case in the Eastern Food Bazaar. So, what is the Eastern Food Bazaar? It is a covered alley. As you can see uh, at the bottom, you see some cobblestone, even though it's um, uh, going through a building between two streets, but it's a covered alley. Uh, it is full of restaurants and communal eating tables, known for its affordable meals and generous portions, situated in the central business district of Cape Town in South Africa. Its location helps to target the tourism market as it sits near museums, but also local workers because the South African parliament, the magistrate court and the public library, as well as transport hubs, such as the Cape Town train station and the CBD taxi rank are within walking distance. As a result, the bazaar is indeed busy, full of hungry customers, especially after hours when young partygoers often mix with workers about to embark on their lengthy commute. And tourists, of course, in search of a quote, 
authentic Cape Town experience, unquote, as advertised on the Bazaar's website. The Bazaar is not a sit-down type restaurant. There are no waiters, which is very important. Um, customers have to queue to order at a till, choosing from all the stalls menus together before delivering their receipts to the cook themselves as each respective stall's counter. So in the bazaar, there are about 12 different stalls, some for beverages, some for food, uh, very different um, culinary traditions, but customers do not order at the stall itself. This is very important, as I'll explain later. They have to go to a till at a, with a cashier and say um, what they want, and then they take the receipt after being paying and to go to any stalls that they want to, to order food, to get the food. It is important to note that the majority of its clientele is from the local Muslim community and migrants from various, various diasporas in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, which are quite prominent in Cape Town. But its central locality and Cape Town's growing tourism industry has increased the amount of Western and white local visitors in recent years, which calls for contextualization in terms of the political economy of culinary tourism. Indeed, the arrival of globalization and the explosion of the tourism industry has increased the demand for tourists to partake in what Sarah Ahmed calls, quote, the consumption of strangers, unquote. In this context, restaurants can both be destinations as well as a vehicle to arrive elsewhere entirely. Gibson 2007 further explains that cosmopolitan restaurants propose a, quote, imaginative mobility, unquote, and the practice of eating other food results in both, quote, dwelling and traveling and traveling in dwelling, unquote. Sarah Ahmed again argues that the thinning of boundaries and increased flows of communication caused by globalization mean that Western consumers are more easily exposed to difference in the form of cultural images. Therefore, businesses serving food in cosmopolitan cities must meet the demand for difference and please the consumer in their search for difference. This is what Long 2003 terms culinary tourism. Quote, it is about food as a subject and medium. It is about individuals exploring foods new to them, as well as using food to explore new cultures and ways of being. Linguistic landscape studies has not shied away from spaces of culinary tourism, and I name a few here. What I propose today is to focus entirely on the graphic templates of the restaurant's menus to unpack the type of culinary tourism offered to patrons. By paying attention to the semiotics of the menu's typographic choices. And before I move on to the next slide, I wanna quickly point out the, 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 the dish that's shown on this slide, which is a typical South African dish called the bunny chow, which originated from Durban which has uh, the biggest um, Indian community outside of India. And it is a quarter loaf of bread where the center of the bread is removed and where they put curry inside and then put the rest of the bread on top. It's a very common dish that is of course served at the bazaar. To ignite your, I'm showing this to ignite your appetite. Um, so typography is, according to Yelahid and Javosky, quote, the process of design, production, and visual organization of letter forms such as shape, size, spacing, etc., to achieve harmony and legibility despite the social context of their use, 
unquote. It was unfortunately neglected in the early days of social linguistics multimodal turn in the late 1990s. Even completely omitted in Kreisen von Leuven's seminal work, 1996 uh, Grammar of Visual Design, um, although von Leuven would later call it a quote, fundamental oversight, unquote, by admitting that it is through typography that, quote, visual communication and writing form an inseparable unity, unquote. Thankfully, Yelehead and Javovsky's 2015 special issue of Social Semiotics provided excellent case studies showing the role played by typography in, quote, constructing and contesting places, identities, and relations of power in urban landscapes, unquote. In order to unpack the discourses and subsequent cultural ideologies embedded in the typographic choices of the Eastern Food Bazaar's menus, I rely on the work of von Leuven's 2006, who designed a semiotics of typography approach to analyze the use of typefaces according to specific characteristics, which should describe their metafunctions. These characteristic features are what make each typeface unique and different from others. They include weight, whether a typeface is bold or not, uh, expansion, whether the letters are narrow or wide, the slope, whether letters are sloping or upright, curvature, which is uh, as opposed to angularity, Connectivity, whether letters are touching or separate. The orientation, whether letters are orienting more horizontally or vertically. And finally, the regularity, whether all letters are on the same line or not on the same line uh, in the text. And you have uh, on the slide some examples of the menus that I will be analyzing in a, in a bit. The menus are important for the business model of the Eastern Food Bazaar. Indeed, patrons must walk up and down the covered alley looking as, at lists of available dishes from each of the dozen or so stalls before placing their order from one of the two cashiers. Once having paid, patrons must go to the stall who offers the dish or dishes they ordered and hand the receipt to one of the cooks. So patrons only interact with cashiers and cooks. This way, the stalls are not in competition with one another to attract customers, as they're all owned and run by the same establishment. This means that the menu's primary function is not to advertise for the lowest price or the most desirable dish, but rather to inform the patrons of what they can expect culinarily. The menus are large black litted boards hung over each kitchen and only two give a brief description of dishes. This could imply so two out of a dozen uh, give a brief description of the dishes. Otherwise, it's just the name of the dish without any description. This could imply that patrons are meant to be familiar with most of the dishes sold or for those patrons who are unfamiliar, the unintelligibility of the items enhances a feeling of exoticness and of being elsewhere. For this type of patrons, so those unfamiliar with the dishes, the lack of descriptions call for other multimodal ways to index the type of food being offered. And I argue these are the typographic choices and other visual representations found above each stall's name on the menus. And the stall names that I'll be looking at are Punjabi, Chinatown, Delhi Pizza, Istanbul Shawarma Falafel, Tandoori, Nizami Kebab, Bombay Bites, and Mandra Dosa House. These semiotic offerings are meant to be read in conjunctions with the stall's name and type of cuisine in order to strengthen the indexicality of an imagined culinary tradition. 
For example, here, uh, for example, as shown here, the menu for Istanbul shawarma falafel features a graphic star and crescent also found on the Turkish flag, as you might remember, um, recognize, along with a scimitar or saber with the curved blade, historically common in Central Asia and associated with Arab cultures. The same menu also shows a man in a folk costume featuring a fez hat and salva trousers. These types of representations are what Hopswom and Ranger 1983 problematized as quote unquote traditional, meaning that they are not necessarily authentic, but either invented or part of a collective imaginary. These are also reminiscent of 18th and 19th century Orientalist art, as was deconstructed by Edouard Said, which included inaccurate Western cliches about the East or the so-called Orient, aiming to make Arabo-Islamic cultures appear attractive and non-threatening, but also primitive, irrational, violent, and thus not part of modernity, which was the European project deemed superior. Said also argues that those problematic Orientalist and colonial representations have in turn been internalized by some of the Arab elites and used for nationalist projects in recent times. This partly explains the presence of such representation of the Arab world in the Arab world itself. As a way to further explore the expectations given by the menus, I will now focus on the graphic ways in which the English-only menus are written by analyzing three examples of typefaces. The typeface presented here can be found on the menu of four stalls in the bazaar. Punjabi, Madras Dosa House, Bombay Bites, as well as the Beverages stall. At first sight, it looks like a modified serif type with added features. One feature is the unevenness of some lines and the unequal height of some letters' legs. The leg of some letters has an added left tilted serif, and others a right tilted exaggerated serif. Let me use the pointer. Um, yes, there's a pointer. Can you see it? Yeah, so here are the tilted serif here for the lower leg and the left tilted serif for the uh, short legs. Um, the leg of some letters, uh, no, I've said that. Letters with some lower legs have their leg veered to the left at the perpendicular angle, such as the one I'm showing here. Another feature is the top curve of uh, letters A, M, and N, and Bs, which has a pointy end. If you look at the top of A's here, here, um, and there. Um, I would argue that the tip is aiming to symbolize the roof of Indian mausoleums, such as the Taj Mahal. As the typeface is used for the stalls with names related to India and serving cuisine categorized as Indian. Finally, two of the most striking features of this typeface are the addition of dots on tops of vowels, such as here, only on vowels, um, and the straight line above all the lowercase letters, as you can see right here. Sitting below the dots and cutting across letters with high tips. I would argue that these two features are also used to symbolize Indian culture via the Devanagari script, which is extensively used on the subcontinent to write Sanskrit or Hindi, for example, as featured on the left of the slide. The script is indeed recognizable by its horizontal line known as Shirarika on top of most letters, as you can see here. 
A particular feature of the Devanagari script is the Anusvara, a round dot-like symbol, a bindu, placed on top of letters to mark a type of nasal sound. As you can see on top here. The script used for the menus in the Eastern Food Bazaar is thus trying to imitate features of the, of the Devanagari script, applying them to the Roman alphabet in order to symbolize Indian culture and reinforce the authenticity of the dishes served. Just checking how much time I have left. Okay, perfect. I'm moving on to the next one. The typeface used in the Chinatown menu, as you can see in the top right, is often mistakenly referred to as a chop suey lettering after the Chinese American dish, because each line of the letters is designed to form curved triangles, whereby the base of the triangle is the only straight line. Some letters have their number of lines in the Roman alphabet reduced as with Ks and Ws, is Ws, you can see it's just three swooshes and the K there. Whereas some whose lines curve too much are designed with additional strokes as with O's and S's. Here's the O which is two strokes and the S's which is three strokes, one, two, three, because curves are difficult to do. This is an example of a type that was designed with the purpose to resemble another culture's style of writing. Unlike the example of Neuland, indeed, Chopsui lettering tries to, quote, emulate the swashing brush strokes used in Chinese calligraphy, unquote, according to journalist Jeff Yang in a Wall Street Journal article on the alleged racism of certain typefaces. The font quote, simply signifies a generic, exotic, non-Western aesthetic, unquote, and has been used to represent Asian cultures very stereotypically. Designer Paul Shaw writes in print magazine that the font first emerged in the 1880s in the United States, which coincides with the first wave of mass Chinese immigration to the country. Shaw goes on to give a brief history of the use of chop suey lettering, its first mainstream appearance was in 1899 on a poster entitled A Trip to Chinatown by the Baggerstaff Brothers, which made it into an influential publication. Because of the poster, the typographic style was associated with the first Chinatown, rebuilt as a tourist destination in San Francisco following the 1906 earthquake. The rebuilt neighborhood had to be, quote, flamboyantly theor the theoretic theatrically Chinese, complete with pagoda roofs and other exaggerated and stylized details, unquote. This is when, according to Shaw, chop suey lettering or the Mandarin typeface, as it's oftentimes called, made it out onto a linguistic landscape for the first time, with restaurants and other businesses choosing the typeface for their signage. The goal was to be able to communicate information, as well as a fake sense of authenticity to the Western tourist, who might already be familiar with the type, thus making the menus more intelligible and reinforcing, reinforcing a sense of familiar, of familiar otherness. The observations resonate well with Ingrid Piller's 2011 analysis of advertising foreign products using foreign linguistic forms. Quote, no matter whether the target group can actually understand the meaning of a foreign form or not, they will be able to identify the form as belonging to a particular language, unquote. The linguistic form here is language, is visual, representation, script, coupled with a multimodal discourse communicated by the Mandarin typeface. We can suspect that such a type was chosen for the Chinatown menu in the Eastern Food Bazaar 
because it represents Chinese culture for the designer of the sign, who in turn expects patrons to also perceive it as something that reinforces the Chineseness of the menu and thus the food at the same time. It is important to note that neither the owners of the Eastern Food Bazaar nor the cooks of the Chinatown stall are Chinese. But as Shaw points out, quote, these fonts ethnic connotations have developed gradually through recurrent appearances on book covers and posters by people who connected the typefaces with their own cultural biases and perceptions, slowly reinforcing the fonts ethnic associations in viewers' minds, unquote. This is a case of what I would call bizarre intercultural communication, where the Western biases and perceptions of a broad culture are, re are repurposed by another culture to have the same communicative impact and at the same time reinforcing the problematic stereotype. Furthermore, the stereotyping is not only problematic, it has a negative affective impact as reporting by Yang who explains how the Asian American community increasingly feels hurt every time they encounter such lettering because of its historical use alongside racist caricature of Asian people uh, resulting in a psychological toll, as I show on the top left of the slides. Nonetheless, Although chop suey lettering emerged in the United States more than a century ago and has been deemed problematic and hurtful by the community it was meant to represent, it is still used. And its intercultural miscommunication has traveled to South Africa via globalization, where it can also be seen in the linguistic landscape of the Johannesburg Chinatown, for example. Although the history of the lettering is from elsewhere, its symbolizing effect remains but the cultural context in which it is used is different than the United States. And in the case of the Eastern Food Bazaar can be seen as an effect to create a Pan-Asian culinary experience and not brand the bazaar as an exclusively Indian food place. I will now move on to the analysis of the sign at the bottom right, Bombay Delhi Pizza. The menu of Delhi Pizza is interesting as the writing of the stall's name features the only occurrence of what Gian Pietro, 2004, refers to as a metal type, meaning a type with straight lines, perfect angles and curves and parallel lettering originally materially produced with metal blocks. Metal types have come to symbolize formality in a Western aesthetic in contrast with their informal counterparts, informal in quotation marks, described by Jan Pietro as being produced with wood blocks and perceived as, quote, cheap garbage, symbolizing informality, the lower classes, and the cultural other due to their repeated use in advertising products and events, stereotyping, um, sorry, and events for the working class and ethnic minorities in the West. In terms of the semiotics of typography approach, this is the difference between regularity and irregularity. So Western types tend to be uh, regular where all letters uh, look the same or on the same level, have the same angles because they were made with uh, metal blocks as opposed to non-Western types, uh, again, representing non-Western cultures, which are irregular because those cultures don't have the modern metal uh, blocks, but rather wood blocks, which create unevenness in the, in the angles or the lines. Um, such adverts also tended to feature stereotyping of non-Western cultures and racist themes on their packaging, which had the effect of forever associating typefaces with sinuous lines in perfect features and messy details to be associated with non-Western cultures in the collective imagination. The colonial ideology prevalent at the time of the development of such distinct typefaces, the early uh, 20th century, 
not only considered such cultures to be inferior, but also to be absent or even not worthy of modernity. So here, not only is Delhi pizza written using a serif typeface in contrast with the dominant with the dominance of informal typefaces on the menus, the coloring of the letters iconizes the Italian flag, green, white, and red. Um, the color choice is quite obvious as it symbolizes the country of origin of the dish. The name of the stall suggests that although this is an Italian dish, it is made with ingredient common of Indian cuisine. The choice of type and coloring is thus explained by the fact that this stall offers the only Western dish in the Eastern food bazaar. But the fact that the stall is named after the capital territory of India, Delhi, um, makes it clear that patrons are not exactly experiencing Italian food, as the feeling of being somewhere in the East, embraced in the semiotic landscape of the place, is conserved in how the pizzas are advertised. And I can move on to my conclusion with five minutes to spare. So in conclusion, I argue that the typefaces are to be read in conjunction with the multimodal assemblages I've described earlier to give patrons the impression of travel, that they're traveling when coming to eat there. These examples of testaments to the need for culinary tourism spaces to offer more than prepared food either to stand out from other restaurants in a competitive tourism market, or to meet the cultural expectations often imagined of the patrons. From this, I would like to formulate the main linguistic argument of this paper. By typographies indexing ethnocultural stereotypes such as the ones I have shown are used as a form of accent. Indeed, because of their social history, and usage, these typefaces index language variations via the cultural representations embedded in the graphic details. The argument follows observations made by Duchenne, 2009, that in a tourism call center context, quote, customers consider accents as a form of exoticism and consequently also as a form of authenticity, unquote. Just like accents help the customer categorize the worker in terms of its cultural legitimacy, the typefaces used on the menus of the bazaar authenticate the dishes as really being Indian, Chinese, or Turkish. Moreover, the expected multilingualism in a space of culinary tourism is here semiotically present in the form of culturally stereotypical typographic features. Indeed, since patrons do not interact with a waiter announcing dishes, as in other types of restaurants, but instead have to read the options by themselves, the experience of multilingualism is staged in a multimodal creative way using typography in order to satisfy the Western visitor. However, the owners of the Eastern Food Bazaar are not Westerners but South Africans from the Indian diaspora. And a large portion of its clientele are not tourists, but members of the Muslim and Malay community. This fact is important for the understanding of the need for culinary spaces to be designed alongside stereotypical cultural lines. Indeed, as, pointing, as pointed out by Bianchi 2009, the analysis of the tourist setting, quote, should not be disconnected from more sustained analysis of the wider economic and political relations of power that flow through and congeal in particular resort settings and hospitality environments." Unquote. The critique here is not of the Eastern Food Bazaar or its business model, but rather of globalization itself, which puts pressure on non-Western owners to propagate problematic Western ideologies, some embracing racist and orientalist representation inherited from colonialism in order for the food to be authenticated. As Paul Shaw points out, quote, 
There is no room for cultural nuance or academic accuracy in a shop's fascia. Restaurant owners want passerby to know immediately that they serve Chinese or Greek or Jewish food and lettering style that achieves this is welcome, unquote. The semiotic landscape of the bazaar thus forms what Wang 2009 refers to as a, quote, staged authenticity, unquote, something tourists and other patrons are very much aware of. They know the menus look like they are written in other scripts, but because they remain readable, they are staged as culturally different. In the end, in the context of globalization, the culinary tourism market dictates the requirements for attracting hungry customers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gilles, for this really thought-provoking uh, paper, uh, which certainly provides food for thought. Ha ha ha. And um, let me try to uh, okay. find. Uh, This is, this, this is really very interesting because he, he, in a way he uh, managed to put together a number of instances which shows the Hollywood aesthetics, if I may say so, of the culinary mm -hmm. industry. Um, my first few days in the US as a Fulbright student, I, I came to know and get friends with an Italian guy who was an architect. And he used to, um, you know, look at the University of Minnesota buildings and um, actually call them fine specimens of Hollywood architecture, which was exactly what they were. They looked like the buildings where um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves could have dwelt. Um, stone masonry that was solid but drawing from an infinite number of sub-styles of, of Western world architecture with stone. France, Germany, Italy were at least represented. So to see that um, there is paneer in a Chinese context is extremely interesting. Mm. And to see, um, an a restaurant called Istanbul, which serves shawarma as opposed to anything else, and falafel, which are unheard of in Turkey. And they would be foreign foods. Um, it's, it's really interesting. I think the examples were very, very poignant um, and, and really illustrate your point. So um, as for the racist overtones of the especially the Chinese food. Um, I think there is a lot to be said about, about how people in their um, respective homes have been using quote unquote traditional script. Uh, Greece has had its share on this, still has. Uh, with the Golden Dawn appropriating angular mm -hmm. classical Greek capital script. Uh, today, I saw a, a, I photographed an ad for some security system or other in which the name of the guy who owns it appears in angular capital letters in polytonic in Greek. Mm. But letters bear no such signs uh, in any point of history for Greek. Mm. So I think um, there are many issues that, that you raise, both for the culinary um, experience of the Eastern Bazaar, uh, uh, but also for what typography does at home. I mean, that's, of course, you can't do it all, but uh, I'm just saying that it is also interesting how typography is understood in the respective cultures that you're talking about. 
Um, I don't know how, um, how common it is to find um, Chinese dishes advertising paneer, for example, or whether it was a one-off thing. But it seems to me they must be pretty common, aren't they? No, it's very unique to this particular place okay. because, they're because they're trying to be pan-Asian and anything Eastern. Okay. It's very broad. It's trying to, to, to represent as many Eastern cultures as possible, but mixed into this new wave. <laughs> so uh, let's open the floor to questions. Uh, please raise hands, uh, the ones of you who would like to uh, post questions to Gilles. Or us, or comments. May I usurp my place as coordinator and ask you something that has been um, coming back and forth in my mind whenever I read about how multiculturalism is represented in the linguistic landscape. Uh, there is obviously a typographic and linguistic component in what you showed us. But I believe that there is also a component that justifies to the turn in the linguistic landscape work as mostly culture studies. Would you like to comment on that somehow? So can you repeat the last part? Yes, yes. Uh, although, uh, although the typographic element and other uh, points that you brought up are mm -hmm. Um, quite recognizably linguistic concerns, although not only, it seems to me that the whole constellation of the issues that you brought up also relate to a wider spectrum of interests, especially those tackled by culture studies. In, yes. my, in my opinion, linguistic landscape has veered quite fast from linguistic and semiotics to culture studies, which is in a way, traditionally at least, a totally different kettle of fish. Would you mind uh, commenting on this? Uh, tell us yes. how you see the picture um, of the field right now. Yeah, so it, it, that's a great question. So the, the way it worked for me, because I worked with analyzing typefaces in, in other works, is that I found that the, 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 the tools given to me by social linguistics or social, of social semiotics, such as von Leuven's um, semiotics of typography approach are great in describing and analyzing the meaning potential of typefaces, but it wasn't giving me enough in terms of understanding the use of those typefaces and, and all the indexicality that was happening there. And that's when I relied in on the the cultural history of those not of the not just of the establishment of those typefaces and the design of those typefaces, but their the history of their usage. Where were they used? For which market? For which audience? By whom? Which explains so much. A very very famous example is um, is Lithos which is um, a, a typeface with a Greek name because it was influenced by, uh, by the lettering on, on Greek monuments. But that is actually a digital version of an older German typeface called Neuland, which nowadays is everywhere and representing Africa. And it, you've seen it a million times. It's on movie posters of anything that represents the jungle or primitive culture or Africa or anything wild and exotic. And it, that's because even though it was designed in Germany to try and be um, a newer version of the traditional Gothic font post-World War I, 
it was a, a wood block type. So it means it was very cheap to produce. And advertisers realized that it was not only cheap to produce, it was um, very readable. And so they started using it to advertise products to um, the black population of the United States, especially, which created a first connotation. And then when it became more and more popularized, it was used throughout the 1950s, 60s, and 70s to represent, uh, sorry, on, on products that were coming from uh, either the Middle East or Africa, which resulted then in uh, uh, a connection of meaning between anything uh, non-modern uh, or from Africa and this and Neuland as a typeface. This is why you find it in some jazz record covers that had African drums, for example. You find it on book covers by African authors, etc. And then came 1989 and the first edition of Adobe Photoshop, which in it had a digitalized version of Neuland called Lithos, which the author claim was actually based on a traditional, so-called traditional Greek typefaces. But because the authors, uh, sorry, the designers who had the first edition of Photoshop, when they saw this, this typeface called Lithos, they associated it with Africa and jungle and anything like that. And so became, because it became more um, easily available and, and people could design with it more often, there was another wave of this use in movie posters or on the internet. And now we see it for any sign that wants to look uh, African or, or, or wild or feral as I've analyzed in other work. Um, a famous example is the, the movie poster for George of the Jungle. They use this typeface or cars that are taking you into the outback. They use the same uh, typeface. So that's why for me, looking into the, the cultural history of the typefaces became very important to understand the meaning potential and the social semiotics today. I hope that answers your question, Kostas. Oh, you're, you're muted, I can't hear. I'm sorry, I was saying, yes, of course it does, uh, in a very rounded way. Thank you. Thank you, Shri. No um, problem. Any, any other um, interventions? If not, I will extend a very, oh, Stella Bratin, we were left speechless by the interesting presentation. Thank you. Stella Bratin. <coughs> is um, Thank you. sending Thank you her, um, a message. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I hope to get a chance to see you again in person soon. Uh, I wish you. we had the chance to get you over here for a lecture or a series of lectures. Unfortunately, this is not happening anytime soon. So we'll have to be content with Zoom for the time. Well, good luck with the series. I saw that it's a brilliant lineup and you have great presenters yes. Um, yes. for the coming weeks. So enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. I and think thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Kalinita se oles ke onus. Ukhalistimu politon akalesmenos mas. Tha sa zume tinali domada. We'll see you next week with a talk, no, in two weeks from today, on the 19th of March, we have Robert Blackwood from the University of Liverpool talking um, on memorialization, museums and linguistic landscapes, neo-colonial French island settings. Yummy, that sounds good. Um, we'll be here, uh, we're expecting you, tell your friends and join us. Have a good evening. Great. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you, Kostas. Thank you, Jean. Bye.